tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 13. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four spine-chilling tales for you, all of them from author Kevin David Anderson, about cryptic calls, dangerous detours, heavenly harbingers, and interior invaders. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscurrypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight from Kevin David Anderson introduces us to a gentleman who receives an unexpected phone call from an unknown number while on a drive. Unfortunately for him, they don't have the wrong number. Without further ado, I present to you the echo at the end of the road. William didn't remember falling asleep or waking up for that matter, but clearly he had done both. It was all he could think of to account for his groggy disorientation. What wasn't clear was why he had his smartphone pressed to his ear. It felt warm and cold at the same time, a counterpoint in sensations that furthered his confusion. Then, as the smooth surface caressed his cheek, his memory sparked. The phone had rung, not the familiar ringtone of a friend or a family member, but that stock item ring, the call from a stranger. Unidentifiable calls he would normally let go to voicemail for later deletion, but not this time. This time he had reached for the device in a hazy mindlessness, his hand on autopilot like scratching an itch without having to think about it. He wasn't sure if he'd already said hello, but the voice in the line, an unfamiliar, distant voice, was in mid-sentence. Very important, William, and I want you to believe me because I wouldn't lie to you. Lie to me about what? William heard himself, his own voice sounding distant. As I said, this is it, man, the voice answered, one that was neither male nor female, but somewhere in between. This is it. I don't understand. What is it? The end of the road, the big climax, the money shot. None of that made any sense to William, and his confusion turned into annoyance, not just at the caller, but annoyance at himself. 
Why the hell did I pick up the phone? Besides, wasn't there something else he should be doing? Something much more important than talking to random strangers? If only he could remember what it was. Well, whatever it was, the sooner he got off the phone, the sooner he could get back to it. He decided to end this. Look, I think you probably have the wrong number. Not true. And don't even think about hanging up on me, Billy boy. Don't you do it. The change in the disembodied voice's tone startled William. What had begun as casual now sounded threatening. Who the hell are you? William said, trying to match the intensity of the caller. There was a sound, like a laugh, or something trying to imitate a laugh, and missing the mark by an unsettling degree. You've known me for a long, long time. William took the phone away from his ear to check the caller ID. Just four letters identified the caller. Echo. I haven't the slightest idea who you are. But we know each other so well, Billy, old pal. The voice's tone turned seductive. You can't get enough of me. You can't be away from me. You love me. Good night, asshole. Oh, you don't want to end this call. Trust me. Why? Trust me or end the call? Either. Well, on the matter of trust, you seem to believe everything I tell you. The voice did that laugh, not really a laugh thing again, and William wanted to remove the phone from his ear, if only to get some distance from that horrible sound. But before he did, the voice continued, And as for why you should not end this call, let's say it's in your best interest. Just tell me why, or I'm hanging up. Because, Billy boy, when this call ends, so do you. What does that mean? Die, Billy. You're going to die. William's chest tightened. Are you threatening me? No, it's just a fact. Okay, William concluded. This is just some trolling prank. Some bored, sick lowlife getting his kicks. Is this doing it for you? William pictured this sad little person, obese, friendless, dialing random numbers in the dark, searching for someone dumb enough or just distracted enough to pick up the phone. What sick, prurient gratification could anyone get from this? Please tell me you're not getting off right now. Get off? No, no, the voice said. Getting off implies satisfaction, and I'm not quite there yet, no matter how many times I do this. Curiosity grew in William. It was the only explanation he had for why he hadn't hung up already. That, and whatever he was doing before the call, he still couldn't remember, was less entertaining. How often do you annoy random strangers like this? Just part-time, or do you have weekends off, or are you full-time? 24-7 creep show. Enough to maintain my anonymity, Billy Boy. You see, it must be at a frequency that passes as routine, almost trite. If I did it only occasionally, someone might take notice. The headline might stand out, but do it a hundred, a thousand times, ten thousand times a year, and it becomes commonplace. Now, no one looks twice as they cruise by another unnecessary ending, sewn into the landscape. Another victim of the times, they'll say. They? They who? Your parents? Your younger siblings? Your asshole boss? That new girl in reception you haven't got the nerve to ask out? What's her name? Karen, is it? A cold wind moved through William. It wasn't a stranger. It was someone that knew him. But he hadn't told anyone about his inability to get past the awkward small talk with the new girl. Who the hell are you? Little old me? I'm your window to the world, not the real one, of course. I'm the doorway to cold relations, mediocre entertainment, and the zenith of convenience. I'm your drug of choice, Billy boy. 
Please stop speaking in lame riddles. Why the hell did you call me anyway? Because this is the way you chose to end it. I'm the last voice you'll hear. One you could have ignored, should have ignored. But you can't ignore me. You never could. Like an addict to the needle, scroll, click, tap, tap, swipe. I hold your attention like a dog on a leash. Because, you know, I'm the one who's going to get you there, man. Get me where? The end of the road. Jesus, make some sense, please. What road? The one you're on. What? The one you're driving on. Driving on? William repeated, his voice sounding less distant. Yes, Billy boy. You are driving. What? He could feel the hard molded rubber of his steering wheel and the grasp of the only hand he had on the wheel, like ice cold water to the face. William's attention suddenly thrust forward past the windshield into the hazy high beams of his speeding vehicle, lighting up the narrow road. His body stiffened, remembering that he had just answered the phone seconds ago. The entire conversation had taken place in the blink of an eye, but that was all it took. Oh, God, no! William screamed, realizing that the road had turned, but he had not. A strange sensation filled the compartment as his vehicle left the ground. The front end of his Prius dipped downward, the car's trajectory, fighting a losing battle against gravity. There was an explosion. Something white punched him in the face. Metal tore all around, sounding like a laugh that was not a laugh. The cacophony of noise soon faded into the background as the blinding pain of his bones and cartilage shattering overwhelmed his senses. When the rolling finally ended, he felt liquid running down his head and neck. He didn't need to see it to know it was blood. William lay still, unable to feel anything below his chest. A blessing that was more biological than divine mercy. Severed spins conduct little feeling. What he could feel was that he was dying, and there was something cold-pressed against the side of his face. Throughout the chaos, for some reason that was far too late to contemplate, he never took the phone from his ear, like a child holding onto a blanket as thunder boomed in the darkness. It's time to say goodbye, Billy. You, you bastard. You did this. You killed me. William said with a final reserve of breath. Yes, it's someone else's fault, not yours. Never yours. That's what they all say at the end of the road. The laugh that was not a laugh sounded one last time. Gotta go, Billy boy. Many more calls to make. Many, many more. Today's episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by NordVPN. Like our podcast, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, the internet can be a very scary place, fraught with dangers everywhere. So what can you do? My advice? Take control of your internet experience today with NordVPN. And right now, you can get 68% off a two-year plan plus one additional month for free when you go to nordvpn.com scary or use code scary. This special offer makes your subscription just $3.71 per month. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash scary to take control of your internet again. Okay, so you're thinking, Otis, what's the big deal with NordVPN? Why should I hook him up? Answer, thousands of super-fast servers worldwide, 24-7 customer support, both live chat and email, six continuous connections with unlimited bandwidth and military-grade encryption, and as a bonus, CyberSec Suite ad blocker. And that'll keep everyone happy. All this security for 68% off a two-year plan plus one additional month for free. When you go to nordvpn.com scary or use code scary. The special offer, again, makes your subscription just $3.71 per month. 
that's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. What do you have to lose? Aside from the fear of getting hacked and losing your identity, I'm sure we've all been there in the past. I have, and if you've followed Scary Stories Told in the Dark recently, you know all about our YouTube issues in the recent past. A little background on NordVPN. They were born in 2012, four childhood friends who spent a lot of time in different parts of the world and saw internet censorship, content control, and intrusive government surveillance growing faster than ever before. The feeling that the internet was losing its main purpose led to a search of possible solutions on how to overcome all the restrictions. The NordVPN name was inspired by Nordic ideals of confidence, trust, and innovation reflecting how we value our customer freedom of choice, how we strive to be innovative with our technology and the way we work. Over the years, NordVPN became a trusted online security solution used by over hundreds of thousands of internet users worldwide. Meanwhile, NordVPN became recognized by the most influential tech sites and IT security specialists. It's now one of the most trusted privacy and security service providers in the world, known for the strongly held values and well-thought-out features. Great reasons to check them out. And with 68% off a two-year plan plus one additional month for free, this special offer makes your subscription just $3.71 per month and it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. All you need to do is go to nordvpn.com scary or use code scary. And please let them know that Otis sent you and thanks so much for your support of this show and our sponsors who make my program possible. I hope you enjoyed The Echo at the End of the Road, as written by Kevin David Anderson and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first story and would like to see more of Mr. Anderson's work and help support him while you do, I'd like to encourage you to pick up a copy of one or more of his books, available now on Amazon. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Horror. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kevin Horror, all one word, and you'll be redirected to our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, where you'll find links to Amazon, where you can pick up a copy of the author's latest books, or connect with him on social media or via their official website. On Amazon, for example, you'll find Kevin's latest, entitled Midnight Men, the Supernatural Adventures of Earl and Dale. Midnight, the witching hour. These are things people fear. But unfortunately for us, the creatures of darkness are not confined to the shadows of the night. Lonely stretches of highways, bustling college campuses, quiet suburban neighborhoods, pricey upscale day spas. They're everywhere. Meet Earl and Dale. A pair of burly truckers seem to be drawn to those that dwell in the darkness. Monster hunters by default that confront the evil fearlessly and with just a bit of humor. Vampires, werewolves, half-human spider demons, and those that prey on the innocent. All will realize they've met their match when they go head-to-head with the Midnight Men. And you can follow along with the adventures of these paranormal exterminators when you pick up a copy of Midnight Men today. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kevin Horror and click the Amazon link to check out Anderson's books today. And if you pick up a copy of any of his works, be sure to leave a five-star review and a kind word and let him know you heard about him on this show. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. It means a lot to both of us. Up next, we've got a second tale of terror for you, courtesy, once again, of Kevin David Anderson. In it, a gentleman and two of his friends are on their way to a toy convention when they're held up by a car accident up ahead. Little do they know there is something far more terrifying than a little rival in their future. Don't let the title of this next tale fool you. What you're about to hear 
isn't all fun and games. Without further ado, I present to you Blood, Gridlock, and Pez. I hate birthdays. Not other people's, just mine. The universe, with its transcendent sense of humor, seems to gather up a year's worth of misery, and then on my birthday, delivers the whole painful lot in one big annual cosmic joke that I never seem to get. On my seventh birthday, my dog was not just killed, but dragged under a car for almost a half mile, screaming. Our house burned down to the ground on my tenth birthday, and on my eleventh, my dad split from my mom, leaving her with a black eye. My sixteenth birthday is the day I received my first sexual advance. A pretty momentous day for most, but for me, it was the day I discovered that many people thought I was gay. To make things worse, the guy making the advance also happened to be my uncle. I threw up off and on for at least a week. But believe it or not, one birthday trumps them all. One which no amount of therapy could erase the images chiseled in my memory. On my 18th birthday, I found myself sitting on the highway next to a corpse. Blood gathered in pools around the body as the afternoon sun gave it a sickly glimmer. I remember thinking how much the dark liquid seemed to belong on the pavement, like oil, transmission fluid, or lizard green coolant. The blood was at home on the asphalt. It's amazing what you notice when events force you to grow up in the span of a moment. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The story really starts two hours earlier with Gina. What the hell? Gina sat in the passenger seat of my 2004 Mazda sedan. We both gawked, open-mouthed at the distant flames, licking the sky about a half mile ahead of us. The car accident that had turned all five lanes of the interstate into a massive parking lot had apparently become more serious. Even in the daylight, the soft glow from the fire cast an orange luster on my windshield. A thick mushroom of black smoke rose from the carnage that bled into the afternoon sky. No way that can be good, I said as the whine of emergency vehicles sounded in the distance. I glanced around at the surrounding vehicles. Most of the drivers had turned their engines off. Every few minutes, a highway patrol car, paramedic or ambulance, sped past along the shoulder, but other than that, nothing moved. Jesus, Craig, we're never going to get there, Gina said. How long have we been stuck here? About twenty minutes, I said. Oh, feels like forever. Why can't they just move the bodies to the side of the road and open up a couple of lanes? I always knew Gina was insensitive, but it was a rare occasion when she actually voiced it. Christ, Gina, people were probably dying up there. Well, I'm dying here, Gina snapped, and I have to pee. I reached over and held out my half-empty big gulp. One container, no waiting. She looked at me as if I just tossed dog shit on her shoes. Have you ever had a straw shoved up your nose? That's why I love you, Gina, I said. All that sweet pillow talk. Eh, go suck an elf. She folded her arms. A groggy voice floated up from behind us. Who are you there yet? Pitt, my best friend, was waking up in the back seat. It had been Pitt's idea to go to the L.A. Toy Convention, just a few hours' drive from our hometown of Delano, California. Knowing my luck with birthdays, Pitt wanted us to get out of town, reasoning that if anything bad was going to happen, at least we'd be near the beach. I looked at him in the rearview mirror, and before Gina or I answered, Pitt's eyes flickered like dying light bulbs, then winked out as he fell back asleep. Growing up together, Pitt and I had developed the same fondness for toys, comic books, video games, and all other things that anchored us solidly in the harbor of our youth. 
Our hobbies didn't exactly endear us to the opposite sex, but they helped forge a bond between us, a bond I thought couldn't be broken. And then came Gina. Shit, he can sleep through anything, Gina said. How would you know what he can sleep through? Gina flicked her hair and dealt me a steely green-eyed glare. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I'd been rehearsing my response to such a remark for two weeks. I started working on it at about the time I caught Pitt and Gina together at school. Nothing was incriminating about their manner. It was simply the fact that they were together. Until then, I was under the impression that they didn't much like each other's company and only endured it on occasion for my benefit. Whenever he could, Pitt told me what a bitch she was, and Gina never missed an opportunity to call Pitt a loser. Seeing them together it just didn't fit, unless I was missing something. The opportunity for accusation had arrived, but as I opened my mouth to speak, a car horn started beeping. The intensity of my gaze should have transfixed Gina, but the odd blurring of the horn stole her attention. She looked back over Pitt and out the back window. I think someone's car alarm's going off. Why would someone turn on a car alarm in a traffic jam? I don't know. There are two cars back. You see them? Gina pointed. I reluctantly turned around. I saw nothing at first. But then the strangeness of the scene drew my gaze like a lightning to a rod. Two cars back and one lane over was a man ramming his forehead repeatedly into his steering wheel. Well, there's something you don't see every day, I said. He's gone crazy. Gina was a big fan of stating the obvious. Well, he is driving in El Camino. That's never been the trademark of sanity. The man, using his car horn as a percussion instrument, stopped abruptly and sat up. Then he began speaking, or possibly yelling. We couldn't hear anything, but he looked as if he was an actor in a silent movie, exaggerating the punctuation of whatever it was he was saying. What do you think is wrong with him? Gina said. I don't know or care. Maybe he has to pee. Gina turned back to me. Look, Craig, do you have something to say? Seriously, because this dancing around crap is getting old. My moment was gone, and my courage left me like helium, escaping a ruptured balloon. She was now the aggressor, and I no longer felt accusatory, no matter what Gina and Pitt were doing behind my back. I sank into my seat and reached into my shirt pocket. I retrieved a collectible Dumbo Pez dispenser, one of the many toys we all collected. I quickly dispensed the grape candy and popped it into my mouth, then held the dispenser out to her. Pez? It was the perfect peace offering. While I was still in film school, we'd met in an online Pez forum. Our conversation quickly moved into a private chat room where we discussed all the finer points of stem colors. If I knew Gina, she'd think the gesture romantic. Her mouth relaxed, her luscious pink lips smiling. A silent moment passed as her features softened, and she again resembled the girl I'd fallen in love with. Just for a moment, I was taken aback. Could I fix this? She accepted the candy and held it in her mouth, then gestured to the dispenser. Doesn't that belong to Pitt? Yeah, I said, taking a deep breath. I took it from him when he fell asleep. I'm holding it hostage until he kicks in for gas, tired of him freeloading. I could tell she wanted to say something in Pitt's defense, but she hesitated and pursed her lips. That's when I knew. Gina and Pitt were together, and this was not fixable. Do you have something you want to tell me? I wasn't really sure if I wanted to hear the answer. Her lower lip quivered. I thought for a moment she might produce a tear, but she suddenly looked out the back window. What's he doing now? Who? That guy. She pointed over her pit slipping head. 
My gaze followed, once again finding the man in the El Camino. He was now slamming his head against the driver's side window and still mouthing some unheard silver screen monologue. Jesus, I said. Somebody get a net. Gina shifted in her seat. He really needs to switch to decaf. She started to laugh, then abruptly looked down at her seatbelt. Damn. What? This belt hates me. It unbuckles whenever it wants to and sticks when I want out. She tried buckling it, but it wouldn't catch. Uh, at our current speed, I think you're pretty safe. Just help me, she said. Why don't you get this damn thing fixed? I reached over and grabbed the buckle. It's a bit tricky. You have to hold the button down and click it in before you release. Our hands touched and she immediately pulled away. Her reaction felt like a knife turning in my gut. Happy birthday to me. I finished securing her belt and then raced forward. With my hands on the dashboard, I rested my head on the steering wheel. I wondered for a moment if Mr. El Camino got any satisfaction by slamming his head into the horn. I know you don't love me anymore, I said. Gina let silence speak for her as she sat forward in her seat. But do you even like me? I felt her hand on my shoulder, and I tensed up, waiting for her to speak, but the next voice I heard wasn't Gina's. It was Pitt's. You guys know there's a guy back there slamming his head against his window? Yes, Gina snapped. Why do you think he's doing that? Pitt said. Why would anybody do that? Craig thinks he has to pee. Wow, Pitt said. Gina turned to look back. What? He just broke the window with his head, Pitt said. I turned around. The man in the El Camino was bleeding from his forehead. Maybe somebody should uh, go see if he's all right, I said. Are you nuts? Gina's gaze met mine. I didn't mean somebody else. I meant somebody else. It came out harsher than I had intended. Pitt must have detected something in my voice because he turned toward Gina and me with a confused look. Okay, what'd I miss? Shut up, Pitt. Just shut up, Gina said. Yep, definitely missed something. Pitt slumped into the back seat. Gina leaned into my personal space. Let's just have a nice day. We've been looking forward to this for months. When we get back... She didn't finish. Maybe it was the first time she was going to say it out loud. Or maybe she didn't want Pitt to know how she was going to phrase it. Hell, I didn't want to know how she was going to phrase it. I looked back at Pitt. He seemed to be catching up to what was going on. And I could tell he wished his dance with the Sandman hadn't ended when it did. He folded his arms across his chest. He may have been preparing to say something, but the look of growing horror on my face as I looked past him out the window must have given him pause. Christ, I said. Gina and Pitt both turned around to follow my gaze. Mr. El Camino had gotten out of his car. He stood next to his open door, his right foot tapping the white line that divided the lanes. His hair was dark and disobedient in all directions, except where blood had matted it to his scalp. His eyes were so wide open that they looked like huge white spheres that would have been more at home on a cartoon character. When he took a step forward, it was awkward and jerky, like the darting movements of the Keystone Cops in a Max Sennett silent comedy. I would have expected Buster Keaton or the great Charlie Chaplin to join him on screen, if it hadn't been for the enormous axe he gripped in both hands. The dried blood caked on the stainless steel blade and his now audible ranting shattered any illusion that what I was watching was a classic from the golden age of silent film. I don't recall the rest of that afternoon as a continuous stream of events, complete with living characters moving from scene to scene in cinematic transition. It's more like still images in a slideshow I'd rather not watch. 
I have a mental picture of him leaning down and peering into the passenger window of the vehicle next to his Camino. He screamed at the glass, leaving speckles of saliva on the window. The woman on the other side of the glass was trying to ignore him. Sitting in the front passenger seat of an all-terrain vehicle, she turned her head away and continued talking to the man in the driver's seat. The driver was also doing his best not to make eye contact with a screaming maniac. They both seem to come from a place where the credo is, if you don't look at crazy people, they'll just go away. I have to believe that the couple would have reacted differently had they been able to see the axe. Mr. El Camino held it slightly behind him, and from the couple's point of view, his presence was merely an annoyance, like a homeless guy threatening to clean your windshield with a soiled newspaper. When we saw it, and the twenty or so people looking on from various vehicles saw it, and we all saw it, and we simply did nothing. Paralyzed with some sick fascination for impending violence, everyone peered out like patrons at a drive-in, waiting for the horror movie to move beyond the opening credits. I guess it hadn't occurred to anyone to venture outside or offer assistance, or at the very least, yell a warning to the couple. Perhaps we all harbored the same childish illusion, the illusion of safety you feel when tucked comfortably in a car with the windows rolled up, like kids hiding under the covers to ward off the closet monster. Without warning or hesitation, Mr. El Camino reared back the axe held high and brought it down on the windshield. The first blow demolished the glass. The second blow did the same to the woman's face. Holy sh! Did you see that? Pitt said. It's time to leave, I said. Dozens of people around us came to the same conclusion. I opened my door and stuck up my foot. The passenger, fleeing the Chevy truck in the front lane, flung his door open. Our doors collided, sending mine back, closing on my leg. The pain was crushing and I felt it in my teeth. A herd of people rushed by and leading the pack was Pitt. He must have escaped through one of the rear doors. When there was a break in the stream of panic, I pushed the door open again, stepping out on my injured leg. I immediately turned back, half expecting to see the business end of the axe, too close to fend off. What I saw instead was the man climb from his SUV and make his way around to confront Mr. El Camino. Or maybe he was trying to help his passenger, now hemorrhaging in long red streams from what was once an attractive face. When he got there, wait. The next few moments are bathed in images I don't wish to remember. So let's fast forward past the next few and pick up the action as Mr. El Camino wrenches the axe from the man's lifeless chest. My portfolio is diverse. Cha-ching, cha-ching. You must diversify. Mr. El Camino screamed. I am at best paraphrasing the dialogue of Pitt, Gina, and myself as years and drink have eroded the day's surplus details. But no paraphrasing of Mr. Camino's words will ever be necessary. Each one has a permanent, almost reverent place in my recall. Like a chiseled epitaph on a family gravestone, they are always with me. When you don't diversify, you get screwed! Cha-ching! Mr. El Camino continued as he brought the blunt end of the axe down like a sledgehammer on the windshield of his own car. Limping southbound, I saw Pitt standing about twenty yards ahead on the left side of the road. He hadn't completely abandoned me, but he wasn't coming back for me either. I started scanning for Gina. She could run faster than both of us, and I figured she was a quarter mile away by now. When I reached Pitt, I kept searching. Didn't see her on the left shoulder. Are you okay? Pitt sounded concerned. Yeah, I, I'm good. Where's Gina? I gazed across the highway to the other side. She wasn't there either. Don't know. Thought she was with you. 
took a deep breath. Figured you both would end up ahead of... And that's when it dawned on me. I'd seen Pitt get out of the car, but not Gina. My stomach seized as I turned around. Oh, God. Back in the car, she was struggling frantically at her seatbelt. A couple of real heroes we were. She can't get the buckle unlatched, I said. Come on. I motioned for Pitt to follow me, but he wouldn't move a step. His jaw quivered, and his eyes were frozen in an unblinking gape. I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he just didn't hear me. Pitt, come on! Pitt shook his head slowly, eyes still unblinking. Son of a bitch! So there I was, about to rush back toward an axe-wielding maniac to save my soon-to-be ex-girlfriend, who had been banging my best friend. If I were successful in this venture, the one most likely to benefit would be Pitt, the same asshole who wouldn't even take a step in her direction. I turned away, disgusted, and started my journey back toward Gina. If ever there was a bigger schmuck than me, surely his 18th birthday wasn't this crappy. By the time Mr. El Camino had finished demolishing the glass in his car and looked ready to move on, he staggered toward an abandoned Toyota just behind my car. If he spent the same amount of time smashing the Toyota's windows, I had less than a minute before he'd move forward again and notice Gina. If I stayed low and quiet, Mr. El Camino might not observe my approach. I could slip Gina out of the car, and we could get away before Mr. El Camino finished up with the Toyota. When I was just a few car lengths away, Gina looked up and saw me. Craig! Help! I can't get... I held my finger to my lips as I ran. But Mr. El Camino spun on his heel, glaring in Gina's direction. He yanked the axe from the Toyota's windshield, showering safety glass under the asphalt. So much for my plan. My credit's spotless. Run it. You'll see. Ching, ching! He stalked toward my car, glass crackling under his boots. When he reached the passenger window, he leaned over and peered in. Gina brought her hands up to fend off the man's gaze. He said, You cost me my line of credit, you bitch. It's not nice to mess with a man's livelihood. He brought the axe up to his shoulder like a baseball player, taking a batter's stance. Then he swung and smashed the side window. My heart sank as Gina's lifeless form filled my imagination. But Gina's head popped into view, still intact. She had ducked under the dashboard, narrowly missing the axe, and now squirmed to avoid the blade again as Mr. El Camino pulled it from the car. The maniac reared back, weapon held high for another blow. I didn't think Gina could dodge another swing, so I executed the first idea that popped into my head. Get his attention. Hey, asshole! I yanked the Dumbo Pez dispenser from my shirt pocket and threw it at him. Pitt and I had been throwing Pez dispensers at each other since we were eight. With a fully loaded dispenser, we had the actuary of South African Bushmen hurling spears. We tumbled through the air, head over end, Dumbo's ears providing the perfect counterbalance to its bright blue stem. Mr. El Camino looked up just in time for Dumbo to hit him square in the forehead. The mental slide I have of this scene reminds me of a cell from a cartoon. That moment when Elmer Fudd, with a shotgun in hand, finally notices that Waskwilly Wabbit bugs Bunny. Do you know what it takes to build a well-diversified portfolio? Cha-ching, cha-ching. Mr. El Camino stepped toward me. I stopped about six feet from him, a distance I hoped was out of axe range. And, no, I stammered, not really. I have perfect credit. He pointed to himself and took another step. I have a diner's club and a platinum card. Cha-ching! Well, that's pretty sweet. But they say I'm spent. He took another step. Sweat and blood were dripping from his scalp. Who says... They canceled my card the same day they sent me an application for a new one. Cha-ching! That says I'm pre-approved. 
spray from his saliva fell just short of my shoes. I was definitely within axe range. That's a real bitch, I said, taking a step back. A perfect credit. He gripped the axe handle with both hands. His knuckles turned white and his whole body started to quiver like a volcano just moments away from an eruption. I started to take another step back. Look, I think. Mr. El Camino reared up with the axe. In that split second before he swung, two choices flashed in my mind. Move forward or move back. Mystifying to me even today, I rushed forward and reached for the axe handle as he swung. My left hand missed, but my right caught it firmly. I tried to twist the weapon away, but he brought the butt of the handle up fast, catching my chin. I staggered back, collapsing under the hood of the station wagon. I was dazed, but still had enough sense to move as the axe blade smashed down next to me, slicing into the metal. I tumbled to the asphalt, sprawling between the station wagon's bumper and the ass end of a box truck. I glimpsed the flash of metal in my peripheral vision and ducked. The axe slashed through the air above my head and thudded into the wooden rollaway door of the box truck. El Camino ripped the axe violently out the door, sending wooden shards and dust in my face. He brought the axe up again, but I rolled under the bumper of the truck, hoping it was wide enough to offer protection. The blade crashed down on the metal bumper. Sparks flew overhead like fireworks. He raised the axe again. My feet were only inches from his leg. I kicked at his knee hard, connecting squarely. In action films, I'd seen this move a dozen times, send bad guys tumbling to the ground, allowing Bruce Willis or Jackie Chan those precious moments they needed to regain their feet and take control of the situation. Apparently, Mr. El Camino hadn't seen any of those movies. He paused for a moment, resting the axe on his shoulder. He glanced down at his knee. At least my Nancy boy kick had registered with him. Not the result I was going for, but I did gain a moment. I was about to scurry under the truck for cover, but caught sight of someone's feet moving behind Mr. El Camino. Those checkerboard kids were Gina's. She must have solved her seatbelt problem and was moving in to help me, but I could see her tiptoeing behind the maniac, and I wondered what her plan could be. There were a few heavy objects in my car she could use to smash them in the head. Full cans of Red Bull, my granddad's wrench, even a brick I used when parking on a hill. All I had to do was keep this guy's attention until she could finish sneaking up behind him. But, as she moved away instead of toward me, I got a sinking feeling. Son of a chicken shit bitch. I gazed up at Mr. El Camino. His head tilted, eyes narrowing, and I imagined him saying, Hey, remember me? The axe came off his shoulder and for an instant, I entertained the idea of not dodging the blow. Just let the finely crafted blade split my skull open and avoid months of pain and self-pity. A birthday present to me, wrapped up and delivered by an axe-wielding nut job. But in that insane and chaotic moment, one in which I could have gone either way, live or die, words of wisdom filtered down from an unlikely source. Mr. El Camino. Women can diminish a man's financial security. It's economic castration. Cha-ching! I had no idea what that meant, but somehow his words spoke to me. It's like when Frank Sinatra starts doing that dooby doo stuff. Nobody knows what the hell he's saying, but everybody seems to get it. El Camino swung the axe, and I ducked. The blade crashed into the steel bumper again, sending more sparks flying. He reared back for another assault and swung at a lower angle, this time targeting my flailing legs. I drew up my feet into a fetal position, banging my knees on the truck's undercarriage. The blade clipped the bottom of my shoes, then punctured the frayed sidewall of the truck's rear tire. 
It was a great explosion of air that pelted my cheek with rubber. Stung like a bitch. But I ignored it and squirmed further under the truck. El Camino didn't seem phased by the explosion. He pulled the axe from the tire and took another swing. It was a wild effort, and it went wide, gouging the asphalt next to my hip. High return stocks can be elusive, he said as he crouched down. I'd managed to scoot my entire body under the truck, safe from further swings. I hoped he would move on to more easily dispatched victims. He reached under the truck and clawed at my feet. I kicked him and moved away, my forehead scraping on the grimy muffler. I'm not over my limit, he said, seizing my shoe. He yanked me toward him, but I kicked off the shoe. His free hand grasped my other ankle, and his grip tightened. I started sliding across the pavement, looking for something to grab, anything. I caught the rear axle, which, to my surprise, is one of the greasiest things you can grab under a vehicle. Really should have taken auto shop in high school. My hand slid down the slimy shaft as Mr. El Camino dragged me out with ease. Once he pulled me back into the afternoon sun, he dropped my feet. Then he moved to pick up his axe. I sat up fast, feeling dizzy. Up to this point, my life consisted of sitting on the couch playing video games, shopping for Pez dispensers on eBay, and sexting Gina. Besides the occasional roll in the hay with my soon-to-be ex-girlfriend, I engaged in little physical activity. If this adrenaline-induced madness didn't end soon, I was going to puke. El Camino turned toward me again. He raised the axe slowly over his head, preparing a straight-on, split-me-down-the-middle blow to end this cartoon. Th -th 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 That's all, folks. I sat there, breathing heavy, my heart pounding in my temples. I tried to move, but exhaustion prevented me. I threw my hands up and yelled, Wait! El Camino tilted his head like a confused dog. The axe hung in the air, ready to descend and take my life, but for a moment he stood there like some murderous statue, sculpted just for me. The next words from my mouth needed to be brilliant. They had to traverse the abyss of madness and somehow carry him over to the side of sanity, where people thought it unreasonable to slaughter folks on a highway with an axe. I said in a trembling voice, It's my birthday. Mr. El Camino processed these words. His head bobbed and one eye twitched. It was like watching a broken machine, wheels and gears grinding away, but unable to complete their tasks. His head suddenly became still, and for an instant, he looked like a man who had just returned from a long and relaxing trip. His mouth opened slowly. I prepared myself for more of his financial nonsense but his next words were utterly and completely sane. Happy birthday, he said. It was the only birthday wish I would get all day. I looked at his face and then the axe. Thank you. El Camino took a long breath, and as he exhaled, he became insane again. Eyes wide, a murderous grin beneath his blood-spotted cheeks. He raised the axe toward the sun. I wanted to dodge the blow. I know I was going to try, but I also knew my body was done. I held my breath and waited. Then I heard two distinct pops, like distant firecrackers going off in succession. I was marginally aware of small impacts on the truck behind me, but had no idea what they could be until the crimson holes in the front of El Camino's shirt started to thicken with blood. His blood. Mr. El Camino dropped to his knees. Behind him stood the youngest highway patrol officer I'd ever seen. He didn't look old enough to go to high school prom, let alone hold a nine-millimeter pistol, gray smoke drifting from the muzzle. If I live a hundred years, I swear I'll never utter the phrase, Where's a cop when you need one? 
The officer might have said something, but an explosion of pain in my left foot kept me from registering it. Mr. El Camino had let the axe slip from his hands. The blunt end landed so hard it separated the sole of my shoe from the canvas. Even in death, El Camino was still swinging. Two hours later, a paramedic determined, much to my surprise, that my foot was unbroken. Hospital x-rays backed up his on-the-scene assessment, but I think they all missed something. Every once in a while, even years later, I'll feel an unyielding urge to limp. I imagine a small permanent fracture deep inside the bone. So deep, x-rays can't detect it. Maybe they aren't meant to. After the paramedics released me, I hobbled over to the shoulder, where Mr. El Camino lay quietly under a yellow tarp. I sat down next to the body as if we were old friends, and in a way we were. To paraphrase Oscar Wilde, at least this friend tried to stab me in the front. Although my birthday had been rough, Mr. El Camino's day had been a bit worse. The evening news would report that Mr. Alec El Camino Harrison, an airline mechanic at Fresno International, had become widowed by his own hand. Earlier that morning he had chopped his wife into a dozen pieces, then tenderly boxed up each part, and then gift-wrapped them. He deposited the packages in night drops at several local banks. The news made no mention of Mr. Harrison's financial situation. On the day he died, he had just turned 46. Happy birthday. The girl in the ambulance says this belongs to you. The young officer who saved my life held out the Dumbo Pez dispenser. Up close, he didn't look as young as when I first laid eyes on him, but he could still pass for a high school senior in a 21 Jump Street kind of way. Uh, thanks, I said, taking the toy from him. If the paramedics are done with you, my sergeant wants to get your statement. He pointed to a burly cop standing behind the ambulance. I could see Pitt in the back with Gina, who was having her head looked at. Her hair was full of glass, and she had a few cuts on her scalp, but nothing serious. I'll be there in a minute, I said. The officer nodded and turned on his heel, leaving me to my thoughts. Later that evening, Gina's father picked her up at the hospital. Other than video news coverage, I never saw her again. About six months ago, she sent me a text. I stared at the message for a long time, but never responded. Didn't see any point. I'm not sure how long she and Pitt lasted after that day. Pitt never talked about her, and I sure as hell wasn't going to ask. Keeping in touch grew harder after graduation. My childhood friend still sends me an email now and again from whatever part of the world he's in. Last I heard, he was diving with sharks off the Australian coast. The latest daredevil stint, much like his base jump off the Eiffel Tower. There's a video of it on YouTube, but I never looked. I'm not really sure what he's chasing with all these idiotic escapades. Maybe it's courage, maybe it's something else. As for me, I never attempted another trip to the L.A. toy convention. After that day, I was kind of done with toys, comic books, and video games. I never realized how much money I'd been pissing away on all that crap until I stopped. Nowadays, my funds are well-managed in a very versatile portfolio, with stocks, CDs, and even a bit of real estate. You see, the key to a really well-built portfolio is diversification. Cha-ching! Cha-ching! I hope you enjoyed Blood, Gridlock, and Pez by author Kevin David Anderson, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author has an amazing selection of stories for sale on Amazon.com. 
visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kevin Horror. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kevin Horror, all one word, and you'll be redirected to the author's profile at creepypastastories.com, where you'll find links to his social media and to his profile on Amazon, where you can pursue a veritable smorgasbord of anthologies he's been included in, alongside his own collections and novels. And again, if you give any of Kevin's work a try, please leave a quality review and a kind word, and be sure to let everyone know you heard about him on this program, and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyre channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. 
And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and add free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? Ha 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 ha.